Hello and welcome to week seven of these 5PB webinars. It's my pleasure once again to introduce you to our two speakers. In our second talk, uh, Chris Jenkins will discuss section 45 of the Modern Slavery Act of 2015, five years on. But first I'll hand over to Jonathan Rees, Queen's Council, who will give us an overview about joint enterprise in international criminal law. Jonathan. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon and welcome to this Five Pit Buildings webinar on joint enterprise in international criminal law. In the title, the webinar is described as an overview and I will attempt to condense down what is a fascinating and complex subject into a broad thread. If you are encouraged by this talk to read further and more deeply into the subject than I can cover here, I would be very happy. Before I turn specifically to joint enterprise, and in particular the subcategory known as extended joint criminal enterprise, or JCE3, let me begin with a general word or two about international criminal law and its history. Slide two, please, Andrew. The origins of international criminal law lie in the tribunals that tried members of the Axis powers after World War II on the basis that wrongdoing of such seriousness and magnitude could not be left and punished by the international community. Some 50 years later, temporary ad hoc international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY, and Rwanda, the ICTR, were established by the United Nations. Created in 1993, the ICTY operated until 2017, the ICTR between 1994 and 2015. Their mandate is continued today by the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, the IRMCT, which takes over the prosecution of remaining fugitives, conducting appeals and retrials, and enforcing sentences pronounced by the ICTY and the ICTR. In 1998, a draft statute for a permanent international criminal court, the ICC, was adopted by an assembly of states. Known as the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, it was ratified in April 2002, and the jurisdiction of the ICC commenced on the 1st of July of that year. Following the Rome Conference, other ad hoc tribunals with specific jurisdictions have been created to try international crimes, including, but not limited to, the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia for the prosecution of crimes committed during the period of the Democratic Kampuchea, the ECCC, established in 2003, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the STL, established in 2009, and the Kosovo Specialist Chambers and Specialist Prosecutor's Office, the KSCPO, established in 2015. Although the creation of the ICC and the ECCC and STL are associated with the United Nations, they sit separately from each other and from the structure of the ICTY, ICTR, IRMCT tribunals. The KSCPO, in further contrast, was established by a domestic law passed through the Kosovo Assembly and although it has its seat in The Hague and is staffed with international judges and prosecutors, the institution is part of the judicial system of Kosovo. Slide three, please, Andrew. Each of those courts, using that term to cover each of the courts, tribunals and chambers I've just referred to, each of those has a founding statute setting out the jurisdiction of that court, the offences which it will try, basic principles, rights of suspects and defendants, and rights of appeal, etc. There are also rules of procedure and evidence that each court has adopted. So, for example, the core texts for each of the above courts are as follows. The ICC has the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, known as the ICC Statute, and its rules of procedure and evidence. Each of the ICTY, ICTR and IRMCT have their own statutes together with rules of procedure and evidence. The ECCC has the law on the establishment of the extraordinary chambers and their internal rules. The SDL has the statute for the special tribunal for Lebanon and its rules of procedure and evidence. And the KSCPO has the law on specialist chambers 
and Specialist Prosecutor's Office. Slide four, please. Each of the above statutes, save for the STL statute, have specific provisions setting out the bases for individual criminal responsibility. For example, Article 7.1 of the ICTY statute, mirrored by Article 6.1 uh, of the ICTR statute, provides a person who planned, instigated, ordered, committed, or otherwise aided and abetted in the planning, preparation, or execution of a crime referred to shall be individually responsible for the crime. The KSCPO statute and the ECCC statute have very similar worded provisions. They are effectively identical. Each refers to accessorial basis for liability as an aider and a better. But in this webinar, we will focus, as the cases that we will look at shortly focused, on the words commit or committed and liability as a perpetrator rather than an accessory. Only one of the articles set out in this slide refers to the joint commission of an offence, and that is Article 25.3a of the ICC statute. That provides, in accordance with this statute, a person shall be criminally responsible and liable for punishment for a crime within the jurisdiction of the court if that person commits such a crime, whether as an individual, jointly with another or through another, regardless of whether that other person is criminally responsible. The ICTY, of course, was up and running before the ICC. So in the absence of specific provisions for the joint commission of an offence in its cortex, the ICTY Appeals Chamber in the case of Prosecutor and Tadich, 15th of July 1999, controversially looked to customary international law to fill what it perceived was a gap. The first time that an international court had undertaken to set out the elements of criminal liability for what it termed joint criminal enterprise. Slide five, please, Andrew. The controversy lay not in the use of customary international law as a source. Where a rule of customary international law can be identified, it is accepted as binding. Indeed, some core texts expressly refer to customary international law as a source of law, for example, Article 3.2 of the KSCPO statute. What is looked for is a general practice and acceptance of that practice as law. The relevant practice must be general, meaning that it must be sufficiently widespread and representative, as well as consistent. A rule of customary international law is one which is created and sustained by constant and uniform practice. The controversy lay in what the ICTY Appeals Chamber identified as customary international law and the basis on which it claimed to identify the rule. The next slide, please, Andrew. Tadjic was charged with crimes against humanity and war crimes. One of the charges related to the killing of five men in the village of Jaskichi. There was no evidence linking him directly to the killing. He was not present in the village. All the prosecutor could prove was that he was part of a group of armed men who were engaged in ethnically cleansing the region and that he had previously taken part in his beating of men in a neighbouring village. Tadich was found not guilty at trial. On appeal by the prosecutor, the ICTY Appeals Chamber found Tadich guilty on the basis of what it called a common criminal purpose and a joint criminal enterprise. Examined in Article 7.1 of the ICTY statute, the Appeals Chamber began by stressing that the foundation of criminal responsibility in international law, as much as in national systems, was the principle of personal culpability. It continued that, looking at the object and purpose of the ICTY statute, it was clear that responsibility for serious violations of international humanitarian law was not limited merely to those who actually carry out the actus reus of the enumerated crimes. 
The appeals chamber observed that the very nature of many international crimes committed most commonly in wartime situations are not the result of the criminal propensity of single individuals, but constitute manifestations of collective criminality. The crimes are often carried out by groups of individuals acting in pursuance of a common criminal design. Whoever contributes to the commission of crimes by the group in execution of a criminal purpose may be held criminally liable, subject to conditions. The ICTY statute, it observed, did not specify what those conditions were, but they could be discerned from customary rules. The appeals chamber then identified three categories of case, which have subsequently become known as JCE 1, 2 and 3. Next slide, please, Andrew. The first category applies where all co-defendants acting pursuant to a common design possess the same criminal intention. For instance, the formulation of a plan to kill where in effect in this common design, they nevertheless all possess the intent to kill. The accused must voluntarily participate in one aspect of the common design and the accused, even if not personally affected in the killing, must nevertheless intend this result. This is straightforward and non-controversial. Next slide, please. In essence, only a variant of the first category, JCE2, provides that a person will be individually liable where one, he actively participates in the enforcement of a system of repression as inferred from the position of authority and specific functions held, with two, the knowledge of the nature of the system, and three, the intent to further the common concerted design to ill-treat inmates. Like the basic form, this is also non-controversial, focusing as it does on the shared or common intention of the participants. So far, so good. Next slide, please. This is where it gets spicy. And the thrust of the controversy will be familiar to us in this jurisdiction. The third category of case involved a common design to pursue one course of conduct where one of the perpetrators commits an act which, while outside the common design, was nevertheless a natural and foreseeable consequence of the effecting of that common purpose. An example of this, the appeals chamber said, would be a common shared intention on the part of a group to forcibly remove members of one ethnicity from their town, village or region to effect ethnic cleansing, with the consequence that in the course of doing so, one or more of the victims is shot and killed. While murder may not have been explicitly acknowledged to be part of the common design, it was nevertheless foreseeable that the forcible removal of civilians at gunpoint might well result in the deaths of one or more of those civilians. The mens rea requirements were said to be fulfilled where there is one, the intention to take part in a joint criminal enterprise and to further individually and jointly the criminal purposes of that enterprise, and two, the foreseeability of the possible commission by other members of the group of offences that do not constitute the object of the common criminal purpose. More than negligence was required. What is required is a state of mind in which a person, although he did not intend to bring about a certain result, was aware that the actions of the group were most likely to lead to that result, but nevertheless willingly took that risk. Sounds familiar? Well, the appeals chamber referred to the position as it was understood then at least in England and Wales, as it did to other common law jurisdictions, such as Canada, the US, Australia and Zambia, and to the civil law systems of France and Italy, all of which they said were supportive of the propositions in JCE3. But they also noted that Germany and the Netherlands restricted criminal responsibility for a crime outside the common purpose or design to the individual perpetrator alone. And that as far as JCE3 was concerned, national legislation and case law cannot be relied upon as a source of international principles or rules. For this reliance to be permissible, it would be necessary to show that most, if not all countries, adopt the same notion 
of common purpose. More specifically, it would be necessary to show that in any case, the major legal systems of the world take the same approach to this notion. The above brief survey shows that this is not the case. So what did the appeals chamber place reliance upon to identify the doctrine of JCE in customary international law? They drew support from Article 25 of the Rome Treaty and similar wording in the International Convention for the Suppression of Terrorist Bombing. Support for the general proposition that common criminal purpose is an established mode of liability in international law and distinct from aiding and abetting. But neither the Rome Treaty nor the Terrorist Convention provide support for the specifics of the more controversial category of JCE 3. The Appeals Chamber instead turned back to some post-World War II European cases. Surprisingly, given the rejection of national case law as a basis for JCE 3, they were not judgments of the International Military Tribunal, familiar to us all as the Nuremberg Tribunal, but they were two cases before British and US military courts and six in the domestic Italian courts. In general, the cases are not reported in any great detail. And as the ICTY Appeals Chamber admitted, the mens rea required for a member of the group to be held responsible for a crime outside the criminal plan was inconsistently spelled out. The two British and US cases illustrate this. Next slide, please, Andrew. Highlighted by the ICTY Appeals Chamber as being of particular importance, the case of Essen lynching involved the lynching of three British prisoners of war by a mob of Germans on the 13th of December 1944. Two servicemen and five civilians were charged with their killing. They included a German Captain Heer, who said loudly that escorting soldiers should not interfere if German civilians molested the prisoners, effectively encouraging the crowd to attack them, while also saying that they ought to be shot or would be shot. According to the summary, the prosecution submitted that if the court was not satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that he had incited the crowd to lynch these airmen, the captain was entitled to be acquitted. But if the court was satisfied that he did in fact say these people were to be shot, and did in fact incite the crowd to kill the airmen, then he was guilty. He was found guilty, as was a member of the escort, Private Conan, who was present and stood by while the men were murdered. Three civilians were also found guilty, one of whom admitted in evidence hitting the airmen with his belt. Two civilians were acquitted. There was no judge advocate and no summing up. The approach of the court to both the facts and the law which they applied does not appear in the report, save that there was uncertainty as to what exactly was the nature of the charge against these men. The wording of the charge alleged that the accused were concerned in the killing of three British airmen. The prosecutor said that for the purpose of this trial, he would invite the court to take the view that this was a charge of murder and nothing other than murder presumably referring to a requirement of an intent to kill or in the alternative cause really serious harm. The report states that the court did not accept that proposition, stating that murder was the killing of a person under the king's peace, that the charge here was not murder, but that, open quotation marks, as long as everyone else realised what was meant by the word murder for the purposes of this trial, there was no difficulty. According to paragraph 208 of Tadich, the prosecution submitted that the court had to be satisfied that each accused was concerned in the killing in circumstances which the British law would have amounted to either killing, sorry, would have amounted to either murder or manslaughter. From this scant information, it can be properly inferred as the ICTY appeals chamber inferred that the court was sure that each of the guilty accused participated in the killing in one form or other. Not much else is clear. <laughs>
whether the court required proof of an intention to kill or whether the alternative lesser intention to cause grievous bodily harm might suffice. Indeed, whether it was satisfied simply by participation in an unlawful act of violence which caused death is not clear. If the court approached the matter as murder, of course, a shared intention to cause really serious injury would have sufficed, of which there appears to have been plenty of evidence. If the court approached the matter on the basis that manslaughter was enough, then it was sufficient that each defendant participated in the unlawful act of violence which caused death. It cannot be said with any conviction that S. N. Lynchin was anything other than a JCEE 1 case. The lynching was not outside the common criminal purpose. Next slide, uh, please. Borkham Island also concerned the lynching of airmen by German soldiers and civilians, this time American airmen. The airmen had been forced down on the island of Borkham, taken prisoner and then forced to march under military guard through the streets. They were made to pass between members of the Reich's Labour Corps, who beat them with shovels upon the order of an officer. They were then struck by civilians. As they passed the mayor of Borkham, he shouted at them, inciting the mob to kill them like dogs. The prosecutor put his case on the basis that all the participants shared the same criminal intent, namely to commit murder. Again, no judge advocate stated the law applied by the court or explained the verdicts. Some defendants were convicted of both participating in the killing of the airmen and participating in assaults upon the airmen, others only of participating in the assaults. The ICTY appeals chamber presumed that the distinction in verdicts was because some of the accused, whether by virtue of their status, role or conduct, were in a position to have predicted that the assault would lead to the killing of their victims. An alternative explanation may simply have been that the court found that all participated in the assaults, but only some defendants, such as the mayor who incited the mob to kill them, shared the intention to commit murder. Again, Borkham Island provides no sound basis to find that customary international law attaches criminal liability for offences committed by others outside the common design and based on foresight alone. Uh, next slide, please. Nevertheless, JCE3, or just convict everyone as it has also been labelled, quickly gained traction in the ICTY. It was reaffirmed by the ICTY trial and appeals chambers in a number of cases, including the prosecutor and Bredanin. The ICTR appeals chamber followed suit in Ruamakuba, October 2004, and Atakarutamana, December 2004 with the chamber simply noting in the latter case. Given the fact that both the ICTY and the ICTR have mirror articles identifying the modes of liability by which an individual can incur criminal responsibility, the appeals chamber is satisfied that the jurisprudence of the ICTY should be applied to the interpretation of Article 6.1 of the ICTR statute. Next slide, please. But JCE3's place in international criminal law is far from settled. It has been rejected by the ICC. The concept of co-perpetration in Article 25 of the ICC statute requires that the suspect must nevertheless fulfill the subjective elements of the crime with which he or she is charged, including any requisite dolus specialis or ulterior intent for the type of crime involved. Next slide, please. The Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the STL, has turned it down also. While the case law of the ICTY allows for convictions under JCE3 for genocide and persecution as a crime against humanity, even though those crimes require special intent, the STL held that the better approach under international criminal law is not to allow convictions under JCE3 for special intent crimes like terrorism. In other words, it would be insufficient for a finding of guilt for an accused charged as a participant in a JCE directed, for instance, to the commission of robbery or murder, 
to have foreseen the possibility that the crimes within the common purpose would eventually give rise to a terrorist act by another participant in the criminal enterprise. He must have the required special intent for terrorism. He must specifically intend to cause panic or to coerce a, natural, a national or international authority. Next slide, please. In the prosecutor and Chia Liang and Q Samvan, 23rd of November 2016, the Supreme Court of the ECCC also gave JCE3 the thumbs down, giving a judicial kicking to the judgment in Tadic in the process. The decisions upon the ICTY appeals chamber relied in Tadic when finding that JCE3 was part of customary international law did not constitute a sufficiently firm basis for such a finding, the Supreme Court held. Too little was known about the S.N. Lynchon case and the Borkham Island case to conclude that a notion amounting to JCE3 was applied therein. The Italian cases referred to in Tadic were either misplaced by the ICTY appeals chamber in that they too did not involve a crime falling outside the common plan, or they were inconsistent and highly context dependent, or they involved ordinary crimes and ordinary Italian law adjudicated by Italian domestic courts and were of limited relevance. The Supreme Court reviewed a number of other cases dating from the post-World War II period relating to liability for participation in the implementation of a common purpose. The vast majority, the court said, does not lend any support to the argument that accused may incur criminal responsibility for crimes that were not encompassed by the common purpose. It concluded that criminal liability for making a contribution to the implementation of a common criminal purpose arose only with respect to crimes encompassed by the common purpose. JCE 3, as a notion of criminal liability, did not exist under customary international law at the time of the charges, 1975 to 1979, the court said. Now, given that Tadic was the first international court to identify JCE 3 and that it was wrong to do so based on post-World War II authorities, the most recent of which was in 1949, the ECCC judgment can be taken as an outright rejection of JCE 3, not merely limiting it to the period pre-1980. After all, it cannot be said that the line of authorities in the ICTY and ICTR based on Tadic can be taken as establishing customary international law themselves when that line was based upon a wrong turn in the law. Is this again sounding familiar? Next slide, please. Well, several attempts have been made to reverse JCE3 before the ICTY, the ICTR and their successor, the IRMCT. Each have been unsuccessful. In Dordovich, 27th of January 2014, the ICTY appeals chamber was confronted with the rejection by the ICC of JCE3 for criticisms of the Tadic analysis of the post-World War II cases and the earlier decision of the pre-trial chamber of the ECCC in Chia Liang and Q Sanfa, which reached the same conclusion as the Supreme Court later did. The ICTY appeal chamber was unimpressed, stressing that the related jurisprudence of other tribunals did not bind the ICTY. The appeals chambers chamber said that <clears throat> Dordovich has failed to show a reason why the appeals chamber should revisit its well-established case law based on numerous sources that both civil and common law jurisdictions recognize liability for taking part in a common criminal plan in relation to crimes committed outside the common plan, but are nevertheless foreseeable. Whilst the appeals chamber did not doubt the persuasiveness of the ECCC decision, it was not bound by it and it did not constitute a cogent reason for the appeals chamber to depart from its own consistent jurisprudence. A further attempt was launched in the final appeal heard by the ICTY appeals chamber, prosecutor and Prilich, 
29th of November 2017. Armed now with a decision from the Supreme Court of the ECCC, the appellants argued that JCE3 was not part of customary international law. Acknowledging that the ECCC had identified flaws in the reasoning of the Tadic Appeals Chamber, the court nevertheless reminded itself that it was the settled jurisprudence of the ICTY that JCE3, as a form of commission of a crime, had been established in customary international law. And here comes a clever nuance since at least 1992 the year before the ICTY was created. <clears throat> Whilst it was not bound by the findings of other tribunals and courts, it reaffirmed that it would only depart from its own previous decisions in exceptional cases <coughs> and where there were cogent reasons to do so. In its last appeal before closing down, the ICTY Appeals Chamber found that the appellants had failed to discharge that high burden and that it would not end its existence by overturning 18 years of its own jurisprudence before handing the baton over to the IRMCT. Well, the IRMCT picked up the baton and ran with it. In Karadzic, 20th of March 2019, the IRMCT Appeals Chamber was faced with a further assault on JCE3, this time firmly based upon the case that has of course been in our thoughts throughout, that is the case of Joji. The appellants argue that the appeals chamber should depart from the mens rea standard of awareness of the possibility that such crimes might be committed, given the recent reversal by the UK Supreme Court of the analogous standard in our domestic law. Foresight, the UK Supreme Court had found, should be treated as evidence of intent only, and that in truth, the English common law had never recognised a common purpose doctrine as the ICTY had understood it. The ICTY had failed to recognise the distinction between the proposition of foresight as a sufficient legal requirement of mens rea and the correct analysis of foresight as evidence of intent only. The IRMCT said that, in the interests of legal certainty, it would follow the previous jurisprudence of the ICTY and the ICTR, and it would depart from them only for cogent reasons in the interests of justice. On review of the judgment in Joji, which was not binding on the IRMCT, the appeals chamber did not find any cogent reason for departing from its own well-established jurisprudence. Joji was not binding on the IRMCT and in the view of the appeals chamber, not directly on point in any event, as it set out the basis for accessorial liability, which the IRMCT regarded as a lesser form of culpability, whereas JCE3 is concerned with liability as a perpetrator. The shift in the law in England and Wales did not warrant reconsideration and reversal of the established appellate jurisprudence of the ICTY. Although the Appeals Chamber in Tadic referred to the position in the UK as it understood it, and that position had turned out to have been wrong, it had found that JCE3 was derived from international sources and not domestic law because there was no common approach among major domestic jurisdictions. That was the position before the reversal in England and Wales, which had only created further divergence now amongst the common law jurisdictions also. Again, the IRMCT Appeals Chamber held, the appellants had failed to show cogent reasons warranting a departure from the consistent jurisprudence of the ICTY on JCE3. Strangely, for a doctrine, the source of which was said to have been constant and uniform practice, the very fact that JCE3 is controversial and divisive appears to have been used as a tool to defend its continued existence in the absence of a common rejection among all domestic juris jurisdictions of its approach. Moreover, there is something akin to a self-fulfilling prophecy in the ICTY, ICTR and IRMCT's repeated references to the fact 
that it is established and settled doctrine within their own jurisprudence, as if that by itself elevates the proposition to the status of customary international law since 1992. What then about the future of JCE3 in international criminal law? And the next and final slide then, please, Andrew. The IRMCT continues the work of the ICTY and the ICTR. Only yesterday, a fugitive from the ICTR, Felician Kabuga, was, uh, who had been indicted in 1997 on genocide charges and arrested in France earlier this month, appeared yesterday in a French court for the application to be made for his transfer for trial at the IRMCT. In future proceedings, we can expect the IRMCT to follow its own jurisprudence on JCE3. The International Criminal Court has taken its own course and turned away from JCE3, as has the STL and the ECCC. What then about new international criminal courts, such as the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, the KSCPO? Unbounded by the jurisprudence of others and unburdened with their own jurisprudence, they will have to choose afresh between these divergent paths. As far as the KSCPO is concerned, as we saw earlier, Article 16.1 of its statute on individual criminal responsibility is in near identical terms to the same uh, equivalent articles of the ICTY statute and the ICTR statute. And it may be tempting for the KSCPO to just adopt the perfunctory approach of the ICTR and simply declare that, as they share mirror provisions, it is satisfied that the jurisprudence of the ICTY should be applied to the interpretation of Article 16.1 of its statute. Indeed, there is an obvious historical association between the, juris uh, between the jurisdictions of the ICTY and the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, which may incline the KSCPO to look for particular guidance from the jurisprudence of the ICTY rather than other courts and tribunals. But the criticisms of JCE3 remain valid. The foundations of the doctrine, as set out in Tadic, are shaky. Its fundamental claim to be part not only of the jurisprudence of the ICTY, ICTR, but of customary international law necessarily predating Tadic is weak and it suffers from the same principal criticism that the doctrine of parasitic accessory liability had been subjected to by the Supreme Court in Joji, namely that extending criminal liability to a secondary party on the basis of a lesser degree of culpability than the principal results in an overextension of the law and its savers of constructive crime. With indictments now having been filed for review by the pretrial judge, Judge Nicholas Gulu, the Kosovo Specialist Chambers may have to reach a view sooner rather than later. Thank you, and I'll hand uh, this back to Andrew.